what a great God we serve, what great truths we can sing about. Our Lord is well today. If you've been blessed already, say amen. amen. Well, you know, you, you look at days like today and you think, you know, on a snow day, I wonder how many folks will make the trek out. Well, you folks have been faithful, and we have just a great group here this morning. And uh, I do hope that this service will be a blessing to you. And uh, you will leave here just uh, so glad you were in the house of the Lord together today. Take your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Corinthians. As you know, we're making our way through this book. We just started here the first of the year. Uh, really, this series will be in this book uh, all year as we're desiring to uh, labor together as a church, uh, always looking for ways to uh, just continue that unity and grow in our bond in Christ as well. And uh, we're going to be looking at some scriptures sure this morning you get moving uh, for this message today. I forgot to mention uh, in the announcements uh, because of our uh, lunch and then business meeting, keep in mind there will be no evening service tonight. So I failed to uh, make that announcement. Just keep that in mind as you plan uh, for your afternoon after the luncheon, after our meeting uh, we'll clean up and all head home uh, for a nice time with your family together. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1 if you will, we'll be looking at verse 18 and uh, really we're going to be go heading in into chapter 2 uh, by the time we're done with this here this morning. Uh, but just uh, to get us a platform, I'm going to read uh, really down through about verse 25 or so. And then uh, we'll, we'll start looking at these other verses here in uh, just a bit as we get into the message. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, look at there, verse 18. You should be there with me by now. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man." Just for a bit of quick review, last week we really considered the subject of a house divided, right? We, we pointed out that I don't believe uh, we have trouble in that area here at Community Baptist Church. Uh, we, we see demonstrated a great spirit of unity uh, within our church. We're desiring uh, to apply what Paul is teaching uh, here to this church at Corinth uh, so we can even then protect uh, the unity and that bond that we have in this local church together. So we're going to learn lessons all along the way as we're looking through these verses, as we're looking through these chapters in, in, in this book of Corinthians to this church of Corinth as we desire to labor together. We, we considered even some things to do when there may be a disagreement within the church. Right, I made a statement to this to this point that uh, having the disagreement or or having a disagreement or not always agreeing on everything isn't the sin. What is the sin or where the wrong then comes in is when there's contention or there's division that builds up. And we learned last week of how we can really guard against that as a church. When we now come to these scriptures here in verses 18. Really, we're going to see into chapter 2 just a bit. You could read that and maybe think that Paul has changed the subject. Remember, he just talked about there, we, we read those first few verses in chapter 1. He brought up the subject of those schisms, if you will, within the church. There were those following after certain men, Paul, Apollos, and Cephas, and those kinds of things. Some were even following Christ, but yet they weren't working together. All right, so when you then come to these verses, and it just seems that maybe he's changed gears a bit. He goes into, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which is saved, it is the power of God. 
I would have you consider this. I don't believe Paul has changed course at all. Fact is, we'll see as we get through these verses more, even more into chapter 2 and chapter 3. When we get to chapter 3 especially, he brings back up the very subject that he's talking about in chapter 1 about how there were certain folks in this church that really just formed certain groups that were following after certain men. So I really believe this, this scripture that we're going to look at today is drawing attention to what I would say are one of the chief causes of conflict or disunity. Right, so what is one of the chief causes of conflict within a church body? That's what I think Paul is pointing out to the end. That is very simple. It is this. When God's people lose sight of what's important. When God's people lose sight of what's important. That's the title of this message this morning is simply, what's important? What ought to be important to us as a church? What ought to be the key important things that we, we hold to? I think you'll see where we'll go with this in just a minute. We'll tie all this together. Paul helps us really discern this thought in these next few verses. And he does that by really stating right out of the gate that there are two very different ways to view the world and the gospel. Right? Look at, again, I know I've read it twice. We're going to read it one more time together. Verse 18, he says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. He goes on in verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. The first group of people Paul mentions see the cross as what? As foolishness, right? To them, it's just foolish thinking. The other group sees the power, or rather sees the gospel, sees the cross as the power of God in their life. So how can people come to really such differing opinions? Paul has, I believe, just described one of the biggest challenges that we face in our society today. Right, you're going to see how this just blends and ties in with what we're going through as a society in this country. Right? There are those that would look at uh, uh, the cross, the gospel, and they just dismiss it as absolute foolishness. There are those that have put their faith and trust in Christ, like many of you sitting here today, maybe many, many of those listening online, and boy, we consider this to be just the power of God in our life. It's the time in our life that changed us. And, and when we see these two really different views or, or different aspects of thinking, we would narrow it down with saying there are then two distinct worldviews, if you will. Right? This is just pretty elementary, so stay with me just for a minute. A worldview, right out of the dictionary. Worldview is a comprehensive conception or apprehension idea of the world, especially from a specific standpoint. So we see here in this just verse 18, 19 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we see really two worldviews being played out for us. Firstly, we would see those that look at the cross as foolishness or the gospel as foolishness, and we would almost call that a secular worldview, uh, one that sees the world basically without God, right? They, they remove God from the entire system. The other is a biblical worldview or what we would consider a God-centered worldview. I want to give you really what both of these define. Uh, one commentator looking at a secular worldview, remember now, this is one absent from God. He sums it up this way. He says, this means that they have excluded God from their thinking. Now, bear in mind, I want you to apply this to our society today. 
right? Not as a church, because we don't think this way, right? God, Christ, he is the center of what we do. You're believers this morning, or I pray you are believers this morning. If you are, you know exactly where I'm going with this, but apply this to our world today. This means they exclude God from their thinking. They reject the idea of absolute truth and think that man determines his own destiny. Have you heard that lately? How about these people believe that the world needs more education to solve its problems? They don't believe God created the world and discount notions of sin and judgment, right? In other words, there's no sin, there's no judgment, there's really not even a creator. To this group of people, right and wrong, listen to this, right and wrong is determined by the consensus of the people, to those people, talk about God, right and wrong and salvation through Jesus Christ is foolishness, right? We see that thinking today. To those people, where there is an absent from God in all that we do, absolutely they would then consider anything to do with God, anything to do with God's word, or an absolute truth, foolishness, just as Paul had laid out. Now, Paul, I believe, asks a pretty profound question in verse 20, kind of dealing with this kind of thinking. Look at verse 20. He says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now, I believe Paul asks a question that everyone should answer. It's a pretty pretty simple question. I, I put it this way. What Paul is asking is, where has this thinking gotten you? Where has this way of thinking gotten you? Where is this wise? Where, where is the scribe? Those that hold to a secular view, one absent from God where there's no creator, there's then no need of salvation, there's no sin in the world. If they hold that world view, if they have that idea... Where has it gotten us? Now apply that to our society today, right? So we would consider when someone has this worldview absent of God, a fairly then godless society, right? God is being removed more and more out of everything we do as a nation, right? We saw it slowly with prayer in schools, you know, taking your Bible. Now we see it just uh, impacting morality, impacting definitions of marriage, now impacting just terms that ought to be very simple of what these are, how they're defined, but yet a godless worldview wants to change all of that. And Paul would say, what is that kind of thinking done? What has it done for you? How has it advanced you? And for our country, we'd say, have we solved the problems with, we'll just list these, poverty by thinking that way? Have we solved the problems of hatred or prejudice? Right? How is a, how is a, a, a worldview lacking of God, how is it advanced in our moral compass as a society? Actually, we've become more selfish, haven't we? We see more of a reckless, more of an immoral society. Paul wanted people to see that the ways of the world, this worldview, don't lead anywhere. Absent from God in our sin, we just become more and more corrupt. Now verse 21 I think he draws a contrast. Look, he says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So now we kind of contrast that, that, that worldview, that secular worldview, with the biblical worldview. And that worldview is this. This is a worldview based on God's unchanging word. In other words, since God is the creator of everything in heaven and in earth, he is the standard for truth. This is the biblical worldview. God is all-powerful, all-knowing, unchanging. You believe that this morning? Say amen. amen. 
right? This is the God we serve. So he's balancing out these two worldviews. One secular absent from God. Where has that gotten you? Where has that foolishness gotten you? And then he points them to Christ. He points them to the gospel. He points them to the preaching of the gospel. So for today, you see the two choices. It's the way of the world or the way of God. The, the wisdom of men, as Paul would put it, or the simpleness of salvation only found in Jesus Christ. And then to really illustrate this, he uses a parallel between the Jews and the Greeks there in verse 20 through 22 through 25. He says, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block. Under the Greeks foolishness, but of them which are called both Jew and Greek, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than man and the weakness of God is stronger than man. What Paul is saying is everyone seems to have an excuse as to why they don't embrace godliness or the gospel or teachings of the Lord. He illustrates this by pointing to the Jews. He said, what did the Jews want? The Jews wanted signs. They wanted more signs. They didn't believe that this Christ preached. Did, he didn't fit what they thought the Messiah should be, right? They, we know this. They wanted a king to come and rule and reign. Uh, they didn't think Christ was Christ uh, by humbling himself and dying on the cross. They rejected the resurrection. But Paul says the Jews, they just want proof. They want proof and more signs. Paul tells them, Christ teaches this as well, that the only proof they needed is in the resurrection. That Jesus Christ arose, he is alive. People can always find excuses for not believing. The Jews did that of their day. For the Greeks, it was different, right? It wasn't signs they looked after. They, they sought for wisdom. Now, this doesn't mean they were open to truth, all right? They weren't seeking for truth. It means they wanted to discover and negotiate truth. In other words, the, the Greeks, they wanted to do things their own way. They didn't want to accept God's word as truth, they loved to debate. They kind of relished in the newest fads or philosophies of the time. You know, they liked that, uh, you know, to, to, to draw out what isn't there. Listen, we see this, sadly, in our world today over and over again. A biblical view... A, a view of the gospel, we're going to talk about that even throughout this message, right? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that good news is so easily dismissed, right? It's just dismissed off the cuff that, that they would consider it to be unscientific. It's, it's too primitive. It's, it's too narrow-minded. You ever heard that? You Baptists, you believers, you're just too narrow-minded. There's got to be more out there than just Jesus. No, there's not more out there than just Christ. It's him and him alone. People will dismiss it as being narrow-minded. They'll dismiss it as being too primitive. But then look what they latch on to. They'll latch on to just such bizarre teachings that draw them away, further away from the scriptures. And we've touched on some of these things. I mean, think of Catholicism and, and all the things, the rituals they go through. Think of Mormonism. Think of Scientology. People latch on to these things because, you know, the Bible way is just too primitive. Grasp that for a moment. Others maybe reject those religions, if you will, or cults, but they would embrace, you know, this mystical teachings or various Eastern religions, just doing everything they can to dismiss the simple truth of the Word of God. Why? Because they're not looking for truth. They're desiring to be God. 
They're desiring to be like God in their own life. They want to decide their own truth. See, that's the difference. We look at the word of God and hopefully today you believe it because you believe it's the word of God. Therefore, it's absolute. Therefore, it ought to be the standard by which we live. They look at the word of God and even those other things that they're following, maybe it's other cults in our society, maybe it's those other Easter religions, but however they're looking at it, they're trying to decide the truth for themselves. What fits me? What fits what I believe? They want to do their own thing. And in that, at the the core of all of this, they don't want to submit to anyone, especially an absolute God. So for our purpose today, and I'll be quick with this thought, but what opinion do you hold to this morning? Is it that secular worldview absent from God or would you hold to a biblical worldview based on an unchanging word of God? I will will say this this morning. It's either one or the other. There's no middle ground there. right? You, You may think you're straddling a fence, but if you're straddling a fence, you're really in a secular view camp. Is God going to be your absolute source of truth? Is his word going to guide and direct your life? Or are you going to be the one to determine and try to figure it out for your own? I would have you consider today the simple truth of the scriptures. As Paul was trying to get back to this church, as they were in a bit of disunity in their church, there were some schisms that have been brought up in the church. They started following after man instead of Jesus Christ. They were taking their eyes off of what is most important. And in all of that, he goes back and says, listen, stop thinking that way and focus on the one who you should keep your focus on. Focus on Jesus Christ. Focus on the gospel. So we see there's those two distinct differences, if you will. Now we'll move over to one distinct identity. Look at verse 26 through verse 31. He says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised. Hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who is of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the, say it with me, Lord. One distinct identity, two very distinct worldviews, Right, a secular worldview, a biblical worldview. Now, what's this identity all about? Listen, we even see here Paul preaching this. God has always reached out to the common man, if you will. Those that are filled with their own sense of wisdom and importance lack the humility required to receive the grace of God. We just know that to be true. Christ points this out in the Gospels. You know, the teaching, it's, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. We know that to be true, not because there's anything wrong with riches. What makes it hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven is that riches tend to make us feel self-sufficient. Right, we have the answers. We, we've created our own path, if you will, in the same way Education can be a great thing, but lots of education leads to make us feel that we can figure things out by ourselves. And boy, I think this is where we are as a a society today. There are those that believe they are so educated 
now they can just change words on us <laughs> and make us feel like we're the ones that don't know what we're talking about. It's made them crazy, if you will. God requires, now back to this distinct identity, God requires that we come to him with humility, right? Willing to be led by him. God wants us to boast in him and not ourselves. Our salvation, your salvation this morning is based on what Christ has done for us, not what we have done. As a child of God, hear this today, as a child of God, our entire identity is anchored in Jesus Christ. And that's the way it ought to be. If you're relying on anything else to get you to heaven, stop today and rely on Christ. It's not of works, it's not of church membership, it's not based on church attendance, it's not based on doing good, it's not based on baptism, it's based on putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. Paul really is telling us that there's who embrace the gospel. Remember, we talked about that. Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, right, shed his blood on the cross, gave his life on the cross, was buried in the tomb, three days later rose from the dead, proclaiming victory over death and the grave. Listen, by putting our faith and trust in him and that gospel alone, we then can live in fellowship with God. We then can have peace with God. These people now, believers, gain a new perspective on life. They see things from God's point of view, and I'd have you consider this this morning. Paul says that those that turn to Christ for salvation and new life, what he's really saying is all of a sudden they get it. Remember when you got it? Remember that day you received Christ as your Savior? Your sins were forgiven. And it was like, ah, that's what they're talking about. That's, that's the peace that they were mentioning. This is the joy that those my neighbors were testifying of. It says a life, a light rather suddenly just kind of turned on in our head. Our, our, our purpose, our direction is changed. Much of what was confusing suddenly becomes clear. The message of the gospel is, listen to this this morning. Those of you that receive Christ as your Savior, you know you're a child of God. The gospel is no longer foolishness, is it? In fact, it becomes the motivation for our worship and praise. The cross, Christ, the gospel, now it, the lights went on. Now we want to tell others. Now we want to share the testimony. Now we don't want anyone, anyone to live another day separated from the holy God. The truth has been revealed. And this is what Paul is doing to this church. He's reminding this church at Corinth, and I believe in you and I as well, here at Community Baptist Church this morning, he's reminding them that their identity is in Jesus Christ. Don't follow after other men. Don't follow after wisdom. Don't follow after anything that draws you away from an absolute truth. Put your focus back on Jesus Christ and the simplicity of the gospel, for that's what changed your life. That's when the light went on in your head. Share that with others. He says, quit looking at everything else and focus on the one who died for you. Pretty simple message, isn't it? Focus on the one who gave his life so that you and I could be saved. This church, as we stated, was going through conflict. Paul says, change, 
change what you're looking at. He says, focus on your identity. He says, listen, you are believers. You're my brothers and sisters in Christ. We talked about those verses last week. He says, I entreat you, I implore you, I beg of you. Now he segues into, remember, there's two different kinds of thinking. There's a worldview, a secular one. There's a biblical one. Which will you choose? And then place that identity back to where it belongs in Jesus Christ and him alone. Then lastly, this morning, we see a distinct approach. I'll go quickly. I want to read this first five verses in chapter 2. And I, brethren, chapter 2, verse 1, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. This is Paul talking to this church, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should, stand, should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul begins just to kind of describe how he taught these folks, how he helped start this church. We talked about that. We, we looked at those verses in Acts. And the first area of this distinct approach is first, we will never win the world, listen to me this morning, through arguments. We're never going to win the world through arguments. Paul was an intelligent man. I think we'd all agree to that. We understand what Paul's background was. We understand what Paul's education was. Many Bible scholars say that uh, if we would put that in equivalency today, Paul would have two earned doctorates, if you will. He was an educated individual. Paul could debate politics. Paul could debate ethics. Paul could debate science and any number of topics. However, Paul knew none of these things could save anyone. You and I, write this down, you and I can't argue anyone into heaven. Listen, people do sinful things because they're sinners, which you and I are. We're sinners saved by grace, but we were here at a point in our life. How do we reach the lost? By telling them of Christ and him crucified. By teaching them that he was crucified for their sin. We must be sharing the greatest news ever. The gospel. It goes back to that. Our job is to introduce the sinner to the one who can forgive their sin and give them new life. It's not political activism, if you will, that changes hearts. You ever want anybody to Christ talking about politics? <laughs> Probably not, right? Because that doesn't change hearts. The gospel does. God is the one who can change hearts and values, and listen to me this morning, even worldviews, not our arguments. Get back to focusing on what's most important. Secondly, we need to boast of the Lord and not ourselves. Remember, this was the problem with his church, right? We, we hammered this out last week. It was all about their favorite teacher or their group, what, uh, instead of what they should have been focused on, which is the Lord. These people were bragging about their groups. Instead, they should have been filled with gratitude and humility for the greatest gift of all. Our job is to boast in Christ. We need to grasp what a great salvation we've been given. We need to constantly remind ourselves of the change that God has made in our lives. It's all of him. It's not of us. And lastly, I'll just throw this out here for our third point. We'll close in just a minute. Third, we need to guard against, I put it this way, we can be too modern. You say, it seems a bit contrary to our society. 
Everyone wants the latest and greatest, right? Everyone wants the newest and shiniest. Paul said he did not use wise and pervasive words or persuasive words, but simply demonstrated the Spirit's power. And this is where I want to go with this. People and churches especially have become so concerned with what I would consider being relevant being modern, being creative, and those things aren't bad, by the way. But we've lost focus in what's important. In the simple truth, what matters most is to proclaim what I've been preaching this whole hour, the power of salvation through Jesus Christ in him alone. Paul says, I didn't use fancy words. I didn't, I didn't get into new philosophies. I didn't try to find a new fad or a modern way to grab your ear. It was the simplicity of the gospel. You know, the best way to show people the power of God in your life is to show them what Christ has done in your life. <clears throat> be a testimony. Be an example. Be the first one to say, this is how God has changed me. This is why my life is different. We'll close with this. What's important to you? That's what Paul was trying to hammer home to this church. And in turn, I believe we ought to then consider that today. What worldview do you hold to? Is it God-centered? It's one or the other. How do you approach others? You just in it for the debate or you in it for the argument or is the gospel at the core of everything you try to tell them about? See, I don't believe Paul changed directions in this conversation at all to this church. He's reminding us that we must remember what is most important. We must remember that it's Christ. It's not our groups, it's not our ideas, it's not our arguments, but Jesus Christ and the gospel that changes people. And I believe what then Paul is telling this church is we ought to spend more time pointing people to him. And in their case, this church at Corinth, if they would have done that, they'd have spent a lot less time arguing with each other. That's what he was narrowing down to this church here. Folks, what's important to you this morning? Has the gospel changed your life? If it has, share it with someone else. Have it be such a motivation to you that you want to share it with someone else. And as we do that, let's preach the simplicity of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we are sinners and in need of a Savior. And the only way of accomplishing that relationship with God is through his Son. Let's focus on the most important. And then let's see that change the secular worldview we live in. Father, we're so thankful for this day. Lord, we are again so thankful for these that were able to be here this morning. Maybe there are those listening online, Lord, that uh, wanted to just be encouraged uh, by singing, by hearing the word of God this morning. Lord, I pray in these next few moments during this invitation that you would truly speak to hearts that are here today. Lord, there, there are uh, just several things we've covered today. And Lord, I believe you're working in hearts in our midst right now. Maybe there's one that's been holding to a secular worldview. But now they're considering the truth of the scriptures. They're considering, Lord, that you're in control of all. Maybe there are some right now considering if they've ever put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone to be saved, to have their eternity settled forever, to know if they were to die today, they'd go to heaven. I pray you'd be with that one that's working through that right now, Lord. Help them to make that most important decision. Maybe there are some considering what they've been spending their time and arguments and debates about. God, we can be just, our focus can be taken away from what is so important so quickly. 
And I pray, Lord, that we would regain our focus to your son and the gospel and that that's what we would desire to see change people's lives. And you would desire to use us in that. Lord, I pray you'd speak to each one today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, listen just for a moment. How about you today? Which worldview are you holding, my friend? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? I'll just ask it plainly today. Do you know for sure where you'll spend eternity? Listen, if you don't, we want you to know today. We don't want anyone to leave this building not knowing that peace, that joy that we talked about. If you're here today and you're not sure, I'd like to just pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out, but I do want to pray for you. Maybe you'd say, Pastor Fisher, I want to know more about salvation. I want to know more about how I can know my eternity settled. I want to know more about how I can become a child of God. If that's you today, would you just slip your hand up nice and high? I'm going to look around just for a moment. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one's looking around. This is just between you and I and the Lord. But if that's you, would you just be honest and say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to settle this down. Look around just for a moment. I'm scanning the crowd right now. Just slip your hand up nice and high. Yes, I see your hand. Yes, I see your hand. You can put it down. Maybe you're here this morning. You'd say, you know, I think I need to just put my focus back on Christ. I can get caught up in the debate of other things. I can get caught up in the arguments about where the world is and the politics of it and just all kinds of things. But today God's just really challenged me to focus on the gospel, focused on being a testimony for him. If that's you today, would you just slip up your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. God's working in my heart in that way. I'd like to pray for you. Anyone like that at all this morning? Just slip your hand up. I'll pray for you in just a moment. Yes, I see your hand. Yes. Yes, I see your hand. You can put them down. Listen, God's doing a work here today. I'm going to do this. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. To that one that raised their hand for salvation, if you're serious, you want to get this settled today, would you look up at me? If you're serious today, you want to get that settled today? You want to take care of it today? We'll do that right now. Brother Bob Riley, would you head to the back? That one that raised their hand, would you just slip up right where you are? Head right to the back. Go back to the foyer there. I got Brother Riley. He's going to meet with you, okay? He's going to show you. Slip right on out. Go right to the back. No one's looking around. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Bob's going to meet you right out there. Folks, let's pray for this one that's responded to the word this morning. God's doing a work in your heart. Do business with him where you sit. You can come to this altar as well. But take care of it today. Let's be sure to be talking about that which is most important. And that's the gospel. That's our Savior. That's what he's done for us. Let's pray together. Lord, we do pray you bless this invitation. Bless those, Lord, that are doing business with you right now, whether it's just keeping Christ-centered, Lord, keeping their perspective right, Lord, asking ourselves what truly matters in this life. Lord, be with this one that has responded for salvation. Lord, we pray you would just make the truth so very clear. Lord, what a, what a blessing this would be to see this one added to your family today. Lord, bless now our invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Jeff, would you come and lead us?